Hello everyone, what is up? It is me, LBMTG, and today I have been challenged uh, with the hashtag MTG Pride Challenge. Uh, is a little thing that's going around on Twitter right now. Most people are making their responses via Twitter, however, I decided to make a video for it. Uh, basically what the challenge is, is it was started by MTG Amino, and basically the challenge is you pick your favorite creators, or just fellow creators uh, for that matter, and then you go ahead and challenge them to list off their favorite card of each color, uh, each color combination, five color, as well as a colorless card um, and it's just a nice way to uh, kind of spread you know some some enjoyment throughout the community and also you get to learn a, bit, a little bit more about the content creators themselves um, by seeing what kind of cards they like from each of the colors so I was challenged by fellow content creator King of Jank of course his link will be down low in the description towards the top you guys should go ahead and check him out if you guys haven't already checked him out thank you so much for uh, you know involving me in this challenge and for nominating me and uh, towards the end of the video I'll go ahead and give you guys uh, my my additional nominations but for the time being we've got a lot of cards to get through so without further ado, we'll go ahead and get right into it. So without uh, any any more delay, my favorite magic cards of each color and combination of colors. So starting off in white, my favorite card is Thalia's Lancers. Thalia's Lancers brings me back a ton of memories from my first uh, good standard deck, I should say, uh, which was White Black Legendary. I was inspired by a list played by Rudy Briska and Ronnie Rittner, which was this Black White Angels list. Uh, and I thought that it was a really cool list. And if you guys go back farther into my channel, you can see that I had... Uh, uh, my first couple videos that got over 100 views, which back then for me over 100 views was like this fantastic thing. Um, now I get that kind of daily, so that's super fantastic and I really appreciate the fact that my channel has grown so much. But back then it was a really big deal for me that those videos had had um, a few hundred views. And they were deck techs about this deck that I really cared about, that I was having a lot of success with. And it was this Black White Legendary deck and Thalia's Lancers could find basically every card in the deck that wasn't a Planeswalker or wasn't a removal spell. It could even find lands because we had things like Gyre Reach Sanitarium legal and standard, so that was super cool. Um, and notably, I said it couldn't find Planeswalkers. This was back before the Planeswalker rule, so um, Planeswalkers weren't actually legendary yet when I was playing Thalia's Lancers in this black-white legendary list, but if they would have been legendary, oh my gosh, I would have won so many more games. I would have had like an 80% win record with this deck instead of probably like a 70 to 75%. It uh, was probably what I had close to um, with this deck, and it was a lot of, lot of fun to play. Um, and I absolutely love it. And so Thalia's Lancers has a nice special place in my heart. The next card uh, for blue is Paradoxical Outcome. Paradoxical Outcome is part of another standard deck that I really enjoyed, which was the Mono Blue Aetherflux Reservoir Paradoxical Outcome Storm deck. Basically, the way that the deck worked is you played out a bunch of zero converted mana cost things, things like Ornithopter, Cathar Shield, and Bonesaw, and then you would just pick them back up and you would draw a ton of cards via Paradoxical Outcome. It was a fantastic, fantastic deck, and then you would win via Aetherflux Reservoir, casting a bunch of spells, gaining a ton of life, and then using Aetherflux Reservoir. We're <coughs> using Aetherflux Reservoir, there we go, to uh, to deal 50 damage to your opponent. So it was a lot of fun playing that deck. Uh, for black, my favorite card is Funeral Charm. This one is has become kind of a uh, a meme to those who to those who know me in real life. Um, <laughs> whenever anyone asks me what the best card in modern is, I will easily rifle off Funeral Charm. Uh, in fact, I I've stopped basically calling this card Funeral Charm. And if I tell my friends uh, the best card in modern, then they will instantly know that I'm talking about Funeral Charm because I absolutely love this card. Uh, I play it in my modern eight rack deck where it does a lot of work for me. There, it's the only instant speed. Um, one black to make a player discard a card spell, so it's very nice to do things in their draw step. You can make them draw their card for turn and then make them discard it right away with Funeral Charm, so if it's a land, they don't get a chance to play it. If it's a creature, they don't get a chance to play it, or if it's a sorcery, they don't get a chance to play it. Only way that that ruins me is if they draw an instant and I cast Funeral Charm, but most of the time that doesn't happen. Um, and then Funeral Charm can also just sometimes be a cool removal spell because it can give plus two, minus one, so it can kill things like Dark Confidant, um, Young Pyromancer, all these just like good cards that have surprisingly one toughness and uh, Funeral Charm can somehow take care of them and I absolutely love this card. It's a fantastic, fantastic spell. Uh, for red, my favorite card is Heartless Hidetsugu. This card has uh, has a nice little spot in my heart as well. Um, I'm really not a big fan of Commander. Commander is just something that I don't play very often and so I don't really enjoy it a ton when I do play it. 
but uh, when I when I was playing Commander about a year ago, uh, the second ever Commander deck I built was Heartless Heat at Sugu. Just a whole bunch of like burn spells and ways to make the opponents lose life. And then uh, Heartless Heat at Sugu was always a fun one because it was either they dealt with it right away or if they didn't deal with it right away, then the game was going to be over in a turn or two. So it was a lot of fun playing with Heartless Heat at Sugu. And then onto green, my favorite card is Mana Gorger Hydra. Again, this comes from a standard deck. My very first standard deck that I ever played was Green White Harden Scales during Magic Origin Standard, and Mana Gorger Hydra was an absolute house in that deck um, because. Every time that they cast a spell, or every time I cast a spell, this thing would get a counter. If I had out a Harden Scales, it would get two counters every time. If I had out two Harden Scales, it was getting three counters every time. And then because, of course, this had Trample, it was hard for them to chump block as well, which made it very, very strong. And this was also one of the cards that sometimes I feel uh, that as a player, you should play with cards that are more... How do I even word this? Cards that make you better as a player. Um, and so Mana Gorger Hydra was one of those cards where um, back then, even at FNMs, I was I never wanted to to get the triggers um, that I missed off on my Mana Gorger Hydra. Maybe like when I was first starting out, I wanted to get the triggers because I was a bad player and I wanted all these missed triggers. But um, towards the end of my time playing with Mana Gorger Hydra, I, I never wanted to miss a trigger with it. And if I missed the trigger, then I did not want the counters, even though it was just at an FNM level. I knew in order to make myself a better player, I needed to learn to help. I needed to help myself learn to remember my own triggers, and Mandogorger Hydra was a big piece in myself becoming a better player by learning to remember my triggers on my cards. Onto Azorius, my favorite Azorius card is Spell Queller. Spell Queller led me to a game day victory during um, Amonkhet. Um, and aside from that, really when I looked at the Azorius cards, the only other card that had a, the potential to make it on here was uh, Cloud Blazer. Um, both cards I feel like are pretty interchangeable for me. I like both of them equally, but um, I feel like I've cast Spell Queller more times than I've cast Cloud Blazer, so I ended up putting Spell Queller on the list instead. Uh, for Boros, I went with Deflecting Palm. This is one of those cards that when you're first starting out in Magic, you, you see the ability to both fog one of your opponent's things as well as deal them damage, and you're like, yes, this is this is exactly what I want. It protects my life total and does something to my opponent's life total. Uh, so when I, when I was newer starting out, Deflecting Palm was definitely one of the first cards that I uh, acquired a play set of because I thought it was the super, super cool effect. Um, and I love the way that it uh, interacts with Emrakul too, how in modern sometimes you'll see people uh, who play burn will put this in their sideboard as a nice way of dealing with uh, Emrakul as well as dealing with cards like Death Shadow as well if the uh, if the Death Shadow is above seven toughness then or above yeah above seven toughness then they're going to be able to kill their opponent um, or I guess above seven power slash toughness then they're going to be able to kill their uh, opponent via deflecting palm so I think it's a really cool card. Uh, for Demir, we have a card that I keep in my sideboard of my modern 8-rack deck, even though I probably shouldn't anymore, um, and that is Shadow of Doubt. Shadow of Doubt just has such a unique ability. Players can't search libraries this turn, draw a card. It's like the ultimate getcha card, where your opponent goes to crack a fetch land, and with their fetch land on the stack, you go ahead and cast Shadow of Doubt, so they basically just paid one mana to, uh, or paid one life to sacrifice a land and then not get to search for it and you get to draw a card in the process so um, it's, it's definitely a card that I enjoy playing. I have one of in my sideboard right now in Modern 8 Rack because it's very good against the Valakut decks um, and then it is, it's even like fine against the three color decks that do play a lot of fetch lands so I run one in my sideboard probably shouldn't but it's again kind of a pet card to me and so I really like Shadow of Doubt. Uh, onto Golgari, the first commander deck I ever built was Marin of Clan Naltoth, and thus I have some good memories of playing with Marin herself. She's just an extremely powerful card, um, and I had a lot of fun back when uh, back when I did play commander reasonably. Then uh, then Marin was definitely my go-to commander, and there was a lot of fun interactions. And again, another card that I kind of accredit myself to um, helping me become a better player because a lot of creatures are dying in that deck, and you have to remember getting the experience counters every time. So sometimes you'd have 17, 18 plus experience counters even though it wouldn't matter because nothing in your deck was higher than 17 or 18 plus, but I just wanted to make sure that I was uh, remembering these triggers and uh, getting these experience counters. So it's another card that um, it was not only just good and powerful to play with, but also helped me grow as a player by helping me remember my own triggers. 
Uh, for Gruul, green, red, I chose Manamorphose. This feels like the least Gruul card ever printed. Um, when Normally when you think of Gruul, you think of cards like Giant Growth and cards that are just kind of like grow your creature, or attack you, play a big thing, and then just kill your opponent as fast as possible with creatures. Um, but uh, for, for me, Manamorphose is by far my favorite card um, in, in the Gruul color combination. Um, even though mainly the only deck that it sees play in is things like Storm, which is uh, blue-red instead of green red. Um, I love these cantrips that are outside of the color blue. I don't know why I love them so much, but I just really enjoy them. Cards like Elvish Visionary and Wall of Blossoms are both two mana green cards that uh, are creatures that when they enter the battlefield they allow you to draw a card, and I really love that effect, and so Mana Morphos being uh, one of those effects outside of the color blue I think is super cool. Um, it's just something that I really enjoy in Magic, and I love how every like crazy deck combination uh, of cards kind of starts with Metamorphose. Like, you'll be sitting there playing, say, blue-green. You'll be playing, like, a blue-green deck, and your opponent's like, man, I hope you don't have a board wipe here. And then, you know, you're just like, um, yeah, Metamorphose, Metamorphose, uh, double white, double white, and then just slam, like, Wrath of God or something like that out of your blue-green deck. Um, <laughs> even though you don't, uh, you obviously aren't playing that. It's just a nice way to, to lighten up the mood a little bit um, by joking with your friends saying how Metamorphose is a legal card. There is still the potential that I could have this board wipe, even though uh, you know that the, the color combination might not actually play those board wipes. So I, I really enjoy Metamorphose both for, for what it is as a card and for what it allows conversations in Magic to become um, just due to the fact that it exists as a card. Onto is it my favorite card is Nivik Cyclops Popper Cube All Star. Every time I see a Nivik Cyclops, it's very rare that I uh, that I don't draft it in Popper Cube because Niv the Nivik Cyclops deck is a lot of fun. Blue red spells, um, and then you get to uh, make this guy attack for four, which is super cool. And then sometimes you can even make him attack for more than that. His because it's plus three plus zero, oh, that does grow pretty rapidly. Um, going from one four seven, sometimes you're attacking for maybe even ten damage with this thing, which is like ridiculous. Um, but it's it's an absolutely fun card, and really Popper Cube is where I've made uh, my memories with Nivik Cyclops, and where I've really learned to enjoy this card. Uh, for Orzov, we have Soren Grim Nemesis. This goes back to the black-white legendary standard deck that I played for a while. Soren was an extremely powerful card in that deck, um, and I remember plenty of times where the plus one, which says reveal the top card of your library and put that card into your hand, each opponent loses life equal to its converted mana cost. Normally, the decks that were playing Soren in standard were playing Soren as their top end, so the cards that they were revealing were like one drops, two drops, maybe even a three drop here and there, um, but in my deck, I was playing a ton of expensive things, like Thalia's Lancers just does five to your opponent, and then you get to draw Thalia's Lancers. I was playing Bruna and Gisela, so if we revealed the Bruna, it just domed the opponent for seven, and I had a seven uh, mana Planeswalker, and I had a Planeswalker on seven loyalty with a seven drop in hand that I was going to be able to play, um, so it, it, it definitely did a lot of work in that deck, and it made for a lot of unpleasant uh, board situations for my opponents to have to deal with. On to Rakdos. My favorite card is Vile Smasher the Fierce. Vile Smasher the Fierce is a card that many people probably know from Commander. It's actually banned in 1v1 Commander because it's just that sweet. Um, but I actually like it for its legacy play. I really enjoy Channel Fireball series where Andrea Mangucci goes through and plays with some uh, legacy decks. And he has uh, one, one, maybe he even played it more than once. He might have played it a couple times where he was playing Vile Smasher the Fierce in Legacy, and I absolutely love it when these just rogue random decks come out in, lo in uh, Legacy and Vintage and are able to do powerful things. Uh, and what he was doing with Vile Smash of the Fierce was he would play this guy on turn 3, and then on turn 4 he would delve away some cards and slam a Gurmag Angler, and then uh, Gurmag Angler of course has 7 converted mana cost, so you would get to dome your opponent for 7 with the Vile Smasher, so it was a very powerful card because then they were down 7 life and had to deal with a Vile Smasher and a Gurmag Angler, so it was a very powerful, very powerful deck, um, and definitely an enjoyable one at that. I'd hi I highly recommend going through and watching those if you enjoy Legacy content, or if you just want to uh, enjoy seeing some cards show up in Legacy that uh, necessarily wouldn't uh, wouldn't always be there. I think Vile Smasher was definitely a lot of a lot of fun watching his his series with that card. On to Selesnia, a Johnny Mentor of Heroes, the green-white plus-one, plus-one counters deck that featured um, Mandagorger Hydra, also had a Johnny Mentor of Heroes, and the deck was extremely strong in that deck. 
or the card was extremely strong in that deck, I should say. Distributing three plus one plus one counters is very powerful, and then if we didn't have um, the need, if our creatures were big enough already, then we had the ability to go through and look in our deck for an aura creature or planeswalker card and put it into our hand. So there was plenty of powerful creatures that, or that you know, synergized with plus one plus one counters. Um, there were some good planeswalkers, like Ajani was, of course, in the deck, um, and so we could find backup copies of Ajani if necessary. Um, and then even finding things like pacifism, I was playing, I think, like a one of pacifism or something like that. Uh, or I think silk wrap was also a, a good enchantment at the time, or a good aura at the, chi at the time. Um, I'm not actually sure if Silk Wrap is an aura now that I think about it, but I know for sure I was playing at least like one pacifism, um, and then of course finding an aura being pacifism was super nice for some some sort of a removal spells to help get the creatures through, which was uh, very nice. And I can also remember uh, ultimating this Ajani several times as well, gaining that hundred life and feeling quite quite good about it. Um, so definitely a lot of fond memories of Ajani Mentor of Heroes. Onto Simic, this is actually the newest card uh, that managed to make the list, and that is Tatiova Benthic Druid from Dominaria. Um, this card kind of captured my heart over the last like month or so. Like I said, I don't play a lot of Commander, but the last two, I would say I probably played Commander two times in the last like three or four months. Um, and when I played the first time, I, it was playing Tatiova Benthic Druid, and I managed to mill myself out, and that was perfect. I was like, this is exactly what I want to be doing in Commander. Forget this whole winning the game thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win the game on my own terms, and I'm just going to mill myself out. Everyone else can, you know, care about life totals and things like that. My big thing is, how big was my deck size? And I was going to bring that down all the way to zero. I drew, like, 30 cards in one turn and it was absolutely fantastic. Had a ton of fun with Tatiova. Um, and then the second time I played Commander I was playing Tassiger. Um, I borrowed a friend's deck and in that Tassiger deck he had cards like Clever Impersonator and Demir Doppelganger to let me make copies of creatures. And uh, one of my friends who I had originally borrowed the Tatiova deck from, he was playing Tatiova then so I was able to uh, after he cast the Tatiova I was able to copy his own Tatiova and then just again mill myself out and it was a ton of fun absolutely loved it gaining life drawing cards playing lands absolute fun card um and tatiova really has uh really has surprised me over the over the past um two times that i've played it in commander which again like i said i don't really play it a lot but i think i might have to just throw together a tatiova deck at some point just as something to have on hand um just in case because i definitely had a lot of fun milling myself out twice with her on to the three color combinations. We're looking at Abzan. This is Doran the Siege Tower. He goes into my Modern Walls deck, uh, which I don't have built in paper, but I have streamed it a few times on Magic the Gathering Online over at twitch.tv backslash Albia's Live. Um, had a lot of fun playing with that deck, and um, I'm sure I'll stream more with it in the future, and we'll have even more memories to come from, uh, from Doran the Siege Tower. On to Bant, we have Tamiyo Field Researcher. Every time I see Tamiyo, I am reminded of my pre-release victory at the Eldritch Moon pre-release. I had the most insane pre-release kit that I have ever seen anyone open. It was just absolutely ridiculous. The deck consisted of Tamiyo Field Researcher, a foil Gisela the Broken Blade, and two copies of Bruna as my rares and mythics that were super strong in the deck. There was also like some other on-color rare. I believe it was something like an Emrakul's Evangel or something like that. Um, but then, so it had this just ridiculous, ridiculous thing of all these mythics, Tamiyo plus Gisela being great mythics, and I was able to have two Brunas to help me find the Gisela again. Um, and then I also had a Liliana the Last Hope in my sideboard. And you know that your deck is absolutely busted when you're not even playing the Lilian of the Last Hope that you opened. So uh, every time I see this Tamiyo Field Researcher, I'm reminded of that victory and how I'm probably never going to have another sealed pull that good, but I'm very happy that I do have the memory of that, uh, of that fantastic sealed pull that I had back in Eldritch Moon. Onto Esper, my favorite card is Esper Charm. So Esper Charm is a three mana instant, destroy target enchantment, or draw two cards, or target player discards two cards. Like I said before when I was talking about Funeral Charm, I do like instant speed discard spells. I don't know why, I just like them. 
Um, and then this is just also has like some fantastic modes. Sometimes destroy target enchantment will be relevant, not often, but even if you're in a mode where you know your opponent's empty-handed and they're not playing any enchantments, you can still just use this at instant speed to draw two cards. Uh, this card is totally underplayed, and I think that if Esper saw more play in modern, more people would be playing Esper Charm. And this is a card that I just I, I think is extremely strong, and just not a lot of people are playing it because Esper hasn't really been um, you know the most played deck in modern quite yet, but uh, every, every time I see an Esper deck, I always think about how good Esper Charm would be in the list. On to Grixis. I'm sure most people were not expecting this one. This is Sidraxis Spectre. Um, Sidraxis Spe Spectre. Wow, I can't even say my own favorite Grixis card. All right, Sidraxis Spectre. There we go. Um, I'm sure most people would probably pick something like Nickel Bolas or Cruel Ultimatum. I'm assuming that's what most people would go with in the Grixis colors. Um, but I really am just not big on those cards. I know it's they're really splashy. They're kind of cool win the game kind of cards. But uh, I'm not really a huge fan of those kind of cards. I usually like the cards that are just really grindy or very um, value-oriented cards that will help you very much in the mid-game more than just ending the game right on the spot, and Sidraxis Spectre is exactly that. I can remember playing this guy a few times in some Modern Masters 3 drafts where he was a total all-star, and this card was actually a rare back in Shards of Alara block and then got uh, downshifted to an uncommon. I think that this card honestly would have been fine as a rare because it was extremely powerful every time I drew it in the, uh, in the draft format. Um, however, I'm, I'm sure most people probably were, were glad it wasn't a rare because it was only like a dollar or something like that. So it's it's nice to see it at an uncommon that they didn't waste a rare spot on it for, for monetary value. But uh, in terms of playability value, this card is absolutely fantastic and I love it. For Jeskai, we're looking at Mantis Rider. Mantis Rider and Lightning Angel were both pretty close together. The only difference between uh, the two cards is their subtypes, as well as the fact that Lightning Angel costs an additional mana for um, one additional point of toughness. I think Mantis Rider is just great. I, th I like it better than Lightning Angel, personally, and when it came to Jeskai cards, it was a pretty easy pick for me that it came down to those two, and then Mantis Rider is just clearly the better card out of the two, so Mantis Rider ended up being my, my favorite Jeskai card. The only other card that I like even thought about a little bit was uh, the Narset, not the Planeswalker one, but the creature version of Narset, because I can remember there being a series on Channel Fireball in the past where um, they played this crazy Narset combo deck, and it was super cool to watch that go off. It was one of those decks where it does literal nothing unless it does absolutely everything, um, and so it was a ton of fun watching that deck be played that I can remember from a couple years ago, um, and so uh, that, that one kind of kind of made me double double check about uh, Mantis Rider, whether it was actually my favorite card, but I think when it comes to Jeskai, Mantis Rider is just my favorite. In terms of Jund, I ended up picking Sprouting Thrynax. Again, going back to Sidraxis Spectre, how I talked about how I just like these grindy cards that maybe aren't the splashiest kind of like best cards, but that they're really good grindy mid-range cards, and that's exactly what Sprouting Thrynax is. He's uh, Jund for uh, a 3-3 three, three Lizard, and when he's put into a graveyard from play, you put three 1-1 one, one green Sapling creature tokens into play. This guy's also really good in like Aristocrat-style strategies, where you can sacrifice him, and then you get three additional bodies, so if you have something like uh, Goblin Bombardment, for example, um, you can basically just dome your opponent for four by playing one card, which isn't too bad. Um, and so I definitely like Sprouting Thrynax as my favorite card from Jund. On to Mardu, my favorite card is Kalia of the Vast. Really, again, I don't play a ton of Commander, never actually got the player in Commander, but I love the flavor behind this card, and I love the artwork. This is one of my favorite art pieces in Magic. Um, I just think the artwork is incredibly well done here by uh, Michael Komark. Um, I think it's really well done, and I love the flavor behind it. When you think about the most powerful creature types in Magic, um, Angel, Demon, and Dragon are really the three that you would think of, and I love that she's able to just put any of those onto the battlefield, um, and I think that this card is very flavor flavorful and very cool. On to Naya, my favorite card is Godsire. Um, I was kind of thinking about whether Wild and the Cattle counted as a Naya card or not, because it does get buffed by uh, having a Plains in play and by having a Mountain in play, so you really do want to be Naya to have Wild and the Cattle be good, so I think that that would have been my favorite Naya card um, had had it counted, but I consider that card to just be mono green, so for me, Godsire ended up taking the spot for, for Naya. Um, <laughs> this card is just incredible. I remember, again, back when I was first starting out in Magic, seeing a card like this 
this was just absolutely broken. It had vigilance and a tap ability, which just blew my mind back then because it could attack, but then you could still activate the ability. thought this card was just absolutely crazy and had a lot of fun uh, thinking about the kind of decks that this card would, would go into back when I was first starting out in Magic. Onto Soltai, we have the Mimeoplasm. Again, similar to how I talked about how Wild in the Cattle probably didn't count for Naya, some people would have said that Tassiger counted for Soltai. I think Tassiger might have counted for Soltai, but I wanted to stay true to the color combinations in the top right-hand corner of the mana cost. Um, and so, honestly, it probably would have been Tassiger if you would count Tassiger as uh, a strictly Soltai card, but... I wanted to, again, stay true to the theme and pick something that had soul tie in the mana cost, and so for that reason, the Mimeoplasm was my choice. I kind of like the flavor behind this card, too, um, how it's just kind of a jumbled up pile of these two random creatures that are in graveyards, and the card's very powerful, has the, has the opportunity to do some extremely busted, broken things, but aside from that, just has this kind of innocuous artwork, too, that makes you think, like, even though it is totally, it, this thing could totally mess you up. It's got, like, a dinosaur head for an arm and it's got like little baby dinosaurs inside of its gelatin body but when you look at it it's just like this giant gelatin blob and it looks kind of cute I'm not gonna lie this thing is kind of uh kind of like scary cute where you know it's uh it's not necessarily cute in the cute sense of the term but it's cute in the uh scary sense of the term I guess that was a horrible analogy I'm hoping some of you understand what I'm talking about there but uh, if not then then just, just, ne never mind okay on to teamer this is the oldest card that we have here on the list and this card is from apocalypse I'm assuming many of you probably haven't even heard of this card this is guided passage uh, guided passage is a teamer for a sorcery reveal the cards in your library an opponent chooses from among them a creature card a land card and a non creature card or a non creature non land card Card, you put the chosen cards into your hand, then shuffle your library. So this is basically a draw three of your opponent's choice, and your opponent gets to take a look at your entire library. As I talked about previously with Vile Smash of the Fierce, I really like the card that uh, the, the cards in Legacy that just show up out of nowhere and manage to do well when you really wouldn't expect them to do so. And Guided Passage was in a 5-0 deck in a competitive uh, Legacy League at one point where um, it, it was just giving you these good, valuable cards, and it was a draw three every time, so you would get some sort of a land card. Um, of course, because you're in three colors, sometimes maybe even four colors, you were getting a reasonable land card. Um, for your deck, and then the creature cards, you're playing extremely powerful cards like Tarmogoyf, Deathrite Shaman, and Bloodbraid Elf, so if they give you any of those cards, you're going to be perfectly fine with that, and then even for non-creature, non-land cards, you're still playing cards like Brainstorm, so just getting a free Brainstorm for your opponent, or maybe even like an Abrupt Decay if you were playing the four-color version or something like that, um, you could go ahead and just get these really powerful cards into your hand, three mana draw three, very nice, even if your opponent does know your entire library, I think it's still a very cool card because your opponent's just dead before any of that matters. For the four color choice, I chose a Traxa. Basically, when it came down to the four colors, it was whether you liked the uh, the Nephilim better or whether you liked the Commander 2016 version better. Um, so we decided to just put four color into one uh, one category. And my favorite of all of these is a Traxa. I like the fact that she has so many keywords and that she is she has the potential to do some really busted things if you have Planeswalkers out there. Um, but even if you don't have Planeswalkers out there, still just a four man a four four with flying vigilance, death touch and lifelink, again, goes back to just being a very good value creature, and I, I really like Atraxa. For five color, my favorite is Progenitus. Progenitus is my favorite green spell to search up with natural order. Um, there have been many games of Canadian Highlander that I've won by sacrificing just some innocuous green creature, like an Elvish Visionary or uh, maybe like a Llanowar Elf, something like that, to search up a Progenitus, put it onto the battlefield as early as turn two or turn three, and then just win the game from there. So for five color, I've definitely, out of all the five color cards in Magic, the card that I've had on the battlefield the most has been Progenitus and so Progenitus easily takes it for five color in my book. And finally, the last one, on to colorless, we have Reality Smasher. Reality Smasher, I just love because it's a big creature, but it also has Trample and Haste, but it's also big in the sense that it's not like seven or eight mana that you're never going to cast it. It's only five mana, so this card does have some power behind it. Um, it's just an extremely powerful card. The drawback ended up not being too too much of a drawback, um, 
the drawback, of course, being that you need to have a colorless uh, source in order to, to be able to cast it. But with things like Eldrazi Temple, with things like Eye of Ugin, um, and then even just like, I played this card a little bit in Standard, where we were casting it off of things like Blighted Fen, which tapped for a colorless, Gyre Reach Sanitarium, which tapped for a colorless. This card was extremely powerful. And it's the kind of card that if you're not playing a strictly Eldrazi deck, then no one expects the Reality Smasher. This was kind of a, kind of a joke for for back when I was playing again during, I believe it was the Eldritch Moon time, I, I was playing two Reality Smashers in my sideboard of that black-white legendary deck um, that I keep ta keep mentioning and keep talking about because I had a lot of fond memories of that deck. Um, and so I was playing Reality Smashers, and no one expects the Reality Smasher, especially out of a control deck. They don't expect the Reality Smasher. And Reality Smasher can just end games very quickly if not dealt with, and so I really, really enjoy Reality Smasher as a card. So with that being said, uh, we have some some nominees now for this challenge. The three people I am nominating are Total MTG Magic with Zuby, as well as Rhino, aka MTG Young Mage. The three of you, I challenge you to uh, con to continue on this challenge and go through each of your favorite cards of each color and each color combination. You guys can make a video as I did here, or you guys can do the Twitter route that most other people are doing. Again, I think it would just be really cool. And then of course, uh, after you guys complete the challenge. Challenge, go ahead and nominate three other content creators or just three other people in the Magic community that you want to hear about their favorite cards for. So again, Total MTG, Magic with Zuby, and Rhino, aka MTG Young Mage. You guys have been challenged. Go ahead and uh, and make your videos or make your tweets regarding the uh, regarding the challenge. So with that being said, thank you guys so much for watching the video. If you guys did enjoy, a like slash comment slash subscription would be immensely appreciated. And of course, I will see you guys here tomorrow for yet another Magic the Gathering video.